Hi. Um, so this is uh, session 3H for your feedback later. Um, please do give feedback. We use it. We really do uh, in the planning for, for uh, uh, later GSC conferences. Um, this presentation is by uh, Larry Strickland and Anu Boka, um, who will be talking about uh, DB2 and in memory or in memory. I, I'm not a DB2 person, so uh, immediately I'm, I'm at a loss, but I'm hoping that after this session, I'll know more. And uh, you are all on mute. So if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Um, and I will uh, set it so that you can uh, unmute at the end of the session uh, for a Q&A session then or just a chat. OK, so um, over to you, Larry and Andrew. Thanks, Anna. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, yeah, did, like like Anna was saying, this session will hopefully give you more of a better understanding of uh, of how um, you can use some of these in-memory techniques and improve your applications and performance. So this will be uh, relatively te technical. Um, so it should be should be a fun and we'll be monitoring the chat. So feel free to drop any questions in the chat and we will try to get them answered either via the chat or we'll stop the presentation and address them verbally. So uh, I'm a product manager at IBM. Um, and and uh, I, I present together with my my colleague Larry at uh, Data Kinetics. He's the chief product officer, um, and we collaborate on a couple offerings here at um, at IBM. And um, for this one, uh, Larry will be speaking mostly about the the technical aspects of the product, and um, and I'll hit some of the the business market uh, trends of the of the product or of the um, of the technology. So. Um, just a real quick overview of what you can expect um, today is in-memory techniques. Um, Larry will walk us through what they look like, what the benefits of each technique are. Um, specifically, we can focus on one called pure in-memory technology. Um, we can focus on one for mixed workloads. And um, we also have a, a framework that's really helpful to think through in terms of how mainframe memory usage, uh, you know, how memory usage happens on the mainframe. Um, and then I'll I'll uh, I'll button us up with the big picture market trends and and talk about well how how can this all apply to us now um, and moving forward. So with that, I will pass it over to Larry, who's going to start us off with a fun math problem. Um, thank you, Andrew. Um, so why do we want to look at in memory technology, or why do we want to look at in memory techniques? Um, and the obvious answer is a, it's a matter of time. Um, retrieving anything from memory is extremely fast when compared to uh, comparing uh, retrieval from disk. So typically we're talking about three orders of magnitude, so a factor of a thousand. So where you may measure uh, one thing in microseconds, you're going to measure the other thing in milliseconds. So, and we talk about microseconds typically when we're talking about in-memory activities, and we talk about milliseconds when we're talking about uh, activities uh, across to a disk. Uh, obviously, results vary with systems, but uh, that that order of magnitude tends to be around about the right ballpark. Um, why is that? Well. There's a number of things uh, that have to happen to retrieve um, something from disk. Um, I won't go through and try and explain all of this, um, but there are a large number of steps that have to happen in order to uh, for a, for a, an application to trigger uh, the need to receive something from disk and actually receive it. A lot of it's managed by the system itself, not managed by the application programmer, which does make things simple, but it does still take a long time. And again, uh, results will vary to, depending on the system. Uh, but what we're looking to do is to remove that period of time. When we're using in-memory techniques, what we're trying to really do is uh, remove that period of time um, of, uh, off to the device and, and back again. Oh, yeah. Um, sorry, uh, I wasn't paying attention to which chart Andrew had. This, this, this is the uh, actual process of uh, retrieving something from disk. And as you can see, there are uh, a lot of operations. Um, 
So uh, next chat, please, Andrew. And yeah, so now I'll talk about some in-memory uh, techniques. So one of the most common in-memory techniques that's used by a large number of uh, platforms out there, a large number of applications and, and, and tools on those platforms is uh, buffers or buffer pools. Um, so the, the basic idea of a buffer pool is an agent um, on behalf of an application will be looking for uh, data. Um, and the first place that'll look is in those buffers. And if the data is already there, then there's no need to actually uh, retrieve from disk. Um, so the way um, it works is, if we go to the next chart, please. The agent makes the query to the buffer if the data is there. Great. If it's not, the agent's then going to go and retrieve the data from disk, uh, put it into the buffer, and then the uh, the agent can retrieve the data from the buffer for the purposes of uh, uh, sending it off to the application. Seems fairly straightforward. Um, however, that there are so uh, there are, it's a lot more to it than that. Um, so we go to the next slide. The, uh, sorry, that's the right slide. Um, one of the, the big challenges with uh, buffer pools is the need to invalidate the data within the buffer pool. So at some point in time, the data that was retrieved from disk and put into the buffer for faster access has to be invalidated. Um, it's going to be invalidated for a number of reasons. Um, one of them is maybe the data on disk has changed. If the data on disk has changed, reading it from the buffer is going to give you an old copy of the data, which is not what we want to do. Um, so mechanisms have to be put in place to flag the fact that those uh, um, uh, that particular part of the buffer is now invalid and any attempt to retrieve this data needs to trigger a retrieval to the disk. The other other reason we want to invalidate information in the in the buffer pools is if it hasn't been accessed for a period of time, uh, we need to invalidate it. And the reason we want to do that is we want to free up the memory that the buffer is using uh, so that more data can be retrieved from disk uh, um, to get faster access. So those are the two primary reasons we want to invalidate. So we, we do need uh, mechanisms to make sure we can invalidate the data and remove it from those buffer pools or, or free up the data, uh, free up the memory in the buffer pool so it can be reused. One technique uh, that most uh, buffer mechanisms will use is what we call a prefetcher. Um, often data is read sequentially. So when we read one row of data, the next thing we're going to do after that is we're going to read the next row of data. So um, reading back uh, blocks of information from disk is often uh, far more efficient. So what we'll do is we will prefetch. So we will collect um, a, a large number of rows, put those in the buffer pools. And then as that sequential read goes through, there's no need to go back to the disk for that new data. It's already been uh, pulled into the buffer pool. Um, and then we get the faster access. Um, so this does require some intelligence uh, within the prefetcher to work out what to prefetch, how quickly to uh, um, prefetch, et cetera. Um, so you know, we, we will see varied results between different buffer pool implementations um, because of this a level of optimization that can go on. So this... Um, Buffer pool technique, as I said, is used by many different uh, systems. So DB2 buffer pools obviously use this technique. Um, obviously, <laughs> there's a lot more to it. I've given you the simple view of it. Um, but the package cache within DB2 also uses a similar technique. Um, instruction pipelines for CPU and data pipelines for CPUs are also using buffering techniques. They're buffering into the cache. Um, but the, it's the same uh, approach um, where you, you're pulling uh, data in close to the CPU so it can be accessed faster. Uh, VSAM buffers uh, also um, using the same technique. Um, many applications will have built their own buffering techniques as well. Um, and the primary goal of this technique is to reduce that wait time when uh, an application has to wait uh, for data retrieved from disk. Um, so retrieving it from memory is going to be much faster. This is not necessarily uh, a, a technique that's being used to reduce CPU. It does have a reduction on CPU, but the, the primary purpose is to reduce that IO wait time uh, for heading off to the disk, retrieving the data and uh, returning. Um, some examples of um, uh, use of buffer pools, um, performance examples. 
So in DB2 version 12, um, they introduced contiguous buffer pools. Um, so previously they had uh, buffer pools, but they weren't contiguous, so they weren't allowing a, a large continuous uh, uh, block of memory. Um, so this is an example of the impact of allowing that larger block of memory um, on a uh, online workload. Um, so two tests done, one, one with, one without, obviously. Um, and there was a reduction in uh, the class to elapsed time of 7% and actually a reduction in the CPU time decreased by 8%. And that was um, largely because the buffer pools no longer need to manage the chains between the different uh, buffer pool, uh, different memory segments. So that, that's an example of um, buffer pool performance improvement um, that was introduced in version 12 of uh, DB2. So um, the next technique uh, I'm going to talk about is in-memory tables. Um, in-memory tables is a, a at first blush looks uh, quite similar to um, buffer pools, but it is actually a different approach, um, and it does get differing results. Um, so first off, um, the table will be in memory. Um, so we're not looking to invalidate anything in the table as we did with buffer pools. Um, we're assuming that the table in memory, we, we, we start with the working assumption that the table in memory is the good copy of the data. Um, so the data obviously needs to be loaded um, from disk or from, or, or from whatever the data store is. I'm saying data store because uh, often in memory tables may be loaded from uh, VSAM or DP2 or IMS or, or something like that, um, or you know, um, MySQL or Oracle if you're off the mainframe, um, and uh, not necessarily disk, although those uh, storage mechanisms will often use disk, obviously. Um, so the reason for doing this is we're actually looking to reduce CPU this time. We're not actually reducing just to remove the I.O. Um, the primary goal is to actually reduce the CPU. So how this varies, if we go on to the next slide, is that we don't invalidate the data in the in-memory table. What we do is we update the data directly into the in-memory table. So if an application needs to update uh, data, it would do it in the in-memory table. And then we have a second process. And that second process, what it's doing is <clears throat> At detecting the changes in that table or, or knows about it through some mechanism. Um, and then it's going to take that data change and it's going to replicate it through the data store. Um, so by doing this, the in-memory copy is always good. There is no need to question um, whether that data is going to be invalidated and the applications uh, can uh, retrieve that um, extremely quickly. So one of the things we can do within memory tables is we can share those different tables um, between uh, different applications. Um, the second we're sharing between different applications or even just across threads, um, we have to start worrying about um, uh, read and write box so that we can ensure that each um, application is getting a good copy of the data and it's not being changed while uh, one of those applications is read. So we now need another block of memory, and that other block of memory is going to help us manage the read-write locks for that uh, that table. Um, and then we can um, uh, take advantage of those locks to control when data is updated and when applications are actually retrieving data to make sure they've got good uh, good data. So in-memory table indexes, um, one of the advantages uh, of having uh, data in memory is we don't ever need to copy the key. So in a traditional index that we're assuming is going to be stored on disk, typically we'll take the key value um, and the location of that key and, and sort that uh, appropriately um, for when we're um, going to need to use that index to retrieve data. In memory, we don't actually need to move the key value. All we need to do is sort the indexes, uh, the memory indexes um, of where uh, those tables are. So in, in this case, if you look at the, uh, the uh, blue um, translucent <laughs> um, over the table row, it's labeled key. Yeah, that one, thanks, Andrew. Um, 
that this is a column within a table and we're going to say this is the key and then the image the actual in memory index also in blue all we're doing is sorting the uh, locations of those. So this is just a set of addresses and we're just gonna sort the addresses and uh, we never have to um, store the key. So let's say this is a bit of memory, um, but it also means that any changes to it uh, are not impacted because we're just, we're just looking at the addresses. Um, we can also create alternative indexes, in this case uh, in green, uh, where we just create another uh, list of sorted addresses um, sorted by whatever uh, a different key uh, or potentially by a different mechanism. So we may have uh, a one index um, that is sorted uh, via a hash mechanism and another one searches sequentially so we can do a binary search um, or uh, even uh, potentially a B tree or something like that. So we can we can have a number of different uh, alternative indexes that even use the same key or overlapping keys. Um, so one of the things we've learned um, in, in going through this is that um, often it is faster to recreate these indexes on the fly rather than persisting them to disk. So to, often when we're, we're reading a new a table into memory, um, we then go ahead and create the indexes after we've read it all into memory. Um, we find this is often faster than actually storing that index on a disk and reading it back. Um, and again, because we're doing that all in memory, uh, we can do it much faster than we potentially can in reading it from disk. Next one, please, Andrew. So um, one of the other things that we can do uh, in memory, uh, and it's very effective when we do it in memory, is, uh, is to sort. So one of the most commonly used sort algorithms uh, is the in is the merge sort, um, and this is a diagram that's attempting to show what the merge sort is. So to do a merge sort, basically we continuously break uh, the data we need to merge into smaller and smaller blocks until we've only got two to compare, uh, and then so we've got a series of uh, essentially pair comparisons. Um, and then what we do is we, once we've got those pairs sorted, which is easy enough to do, it's either which one, whichever one's bigger, um, we then merge those um, those individual uh, uh, breakdowns together until we get the ordered list at the bottom. So that uh, diagram on the right shows the, the random numbers at the top being uh, broken down into a series of individual pairs and then recombined uh, through the, the merging mechanism to actually get the final number, um, final uh, list of numbers. So the big advantage here is if this is all done in memory uh, and potentially we're just using pointers to those rather than actually moving the data itself, uh, it can be extremely fast in, in memory. Um, but there are, as you can see, as we go through this, there's a lot of interim steps. So there has to be a lot of interim results. The second we start running out of memory to do this, we have to take those interim results and put them on disk. And when we put them on disk, we've got that IO weight. And as a result, things slow down. So if we can do it all in memory, it's going to be very fast. Even if we can't do it all in memory, if we can minimize those interim results that we have to store to disk, um, we're going to be uh, much uh, faster. Um, next slide. So in DB2 uh, version 12, um, they actually added um, a bunch of memory capability, uh, memory uh, available for um, these in-memory sorts. Um, so they expanded the minimum number of nodes in, in a sort tree from 32,000 to 512,000. So significant um, uh, improvement, so that's non-parallel. There's only 128,000 for parallel sorts. Um, so if you have memory available that you can allocate to DB2 and DB2 can use it in this way, you will see it in performance and results. So I think the next slide here, I talk about the results. Yeah, so um, whilst um, particular um, workloads would see a massive um, improvement in performance. Um, when we look at generic workloads, um, we, uh, we, we still see um, uh, performance improvements. 
So um, again, IBM ran some tests uh, with DB2 version 12 by allocating extra memory to do this uh, in-memory sort. Um, and SAP workloads, um, certain queries were reduced by 5%. Um, and in the uh, retail warehouse workloads, uh, there were some queries that were reduced by 14 or uh, 6%. Um, so th these results were very good. Um, what we have seen though is workloads that are very specifically between those, the, what the old limit was of 32,000 and not the new limit is 512,000. We, we saw an order of magnitude reduction in uh, CPU performance. So another in-memory technique, um, I call it a hash, it's a, a particular type of index. So we're talking about a hash index. So the nice thing uh, about a hash index is we don't need to do a search necessarily to find something. What we do is we put the key through a function. Uh, this function tends to randomize uh, what well, gives the appearance of a completely random um, um, output. Um, so what we do is when we're working out which index slot we're going to put a particular um, index element in, we put the, the key into the function and it comes out with a number. So in this, this case, I've got a key that is A, B, C, or D. Um, and when I put it into my function, I get a number between zero and seven out. Um, it is important that the number of address slots I have is much larger than the number of keys I have, um, or else um, I'm going to see a lot more collision. So one of the downsides of using this mechanism is I could get a collision. So I could put A in and B in, and they both could return to. Um, so now then I need a, a mechanism to work out how to deal with collisions, which can slow things down. Um, but generally, uh, it's going to be um, a very fast mechanism, particularly for large, uh, a large number of rows. Um, and we do spend quite a bit of time playing with these different functions to work out which one's going to be quicker. So I think there's a build on this chart, Andrew. Yeah, thank you. So empirically, um, in working with in-memory tables, um, results would vary for different uh, types of tables, but um, in-memory tables, uh, we've discovered that different indexes, uh, uh, different uh, index calculation methods um, will give you varying results. So typically when we're looking at in-memory, um, we're seeing rows, where there's less than 10 rows, the serial search is faster. So just start at the top and work your way down. That's going to be the fastest way to find the row you want. If we're between 10 and 100 rows, um, then typically we're looking at a binary search. So look in the middle and then decide whether it's higher or lower and, and split that and continue to split your, uh, your search point until you find the row you're looking for. And, and lastly, um, if the rows, number of rows is greater than 100, we find the hash search mechanism is generally going to be the fastest approach. Um, so when you're looking at tables with literally hundreds of thousands of rows in them, uh, which we often uh, see, uh, then almost certainly the hash algorithm is going to be the fastest way to access that. Um, although uh, even there, uh, you can come across anomalies where the hash algorithm um, happens to not work well with a particular key structure that's being used, um, and then you may have to switch to a different technique. So, um, so many systems recognize that in memory tables are very fast, um, and um, and as uh, gives in some examples here. So DB2 um, has an in-memory table. In effect, DB2, when you're talking about um, fixing something in a buffer pool, effectively you've created an in-memory table by doing that. Um, there's what I'll refer to as pure memory tables. So these are um, table managers, uh, not databases, but table managers um, that are specifically designed to help the developer manage tables in memory. Um, so obviously our product, uh, uh, decal table base, but also IBM's um, IZTA or IBM Z table accelerator uh, uses that uh, pure in memory table approach. Um, uh, different uh, languages actually will provide you the ability to do in memory tables, um, whether it be an array or uh, some kind of structure. Um, but COBOL, COBOL internal tables would be another one. Um, sometimes these are often limited by how they're doing their indexes. Um, so the larger the um, the index, the the more uh, impactful 
they can be the slower they become. Um, the other challenge with some of these is they're not shareable, so they can't be shared between applications because it's within the language itself. Um, we've also uh, know a number of companies have built their own um, and have had great success, um, particularly where those homegrown uh, in-memory accelerators have been uh, designed specifically for an application. Uh, that application can actually see a lot more in performance. So it is um, good to compare results. Um, so I talked about both DB2 and uh, IBM Table Accelerator have uh, used in-memory tables. Um, the performances will be different. DB2 is a database. It's going to be doing a lot more um, uh, uh, things than a simple table uh, manager. Um, and as a result, uh, it's got a, a lot more uh, um, a lot longer code path to execute to retrieve data uh, compared to a um, pure in memory table. Um, that is not to say you can just simply replace um, um, DB2 with a table accelerator. You cannot, but there will be specific workloads and specific tables um, that the uh, something like the IBM Z table accelerator can really uh, improve performance. Um, so this is some results uh, measured uh, between uh, DB2 and IBM Z table accelerator. As you can see, um, the um, and this is just a, a small table that's quite simple to read, uh, very straightforward. And as you can see, the uh, IBM C table accelerator, depending on your access method or whether you're populating or reading, um, you get uh, quite significant uh, performance improvement with IBM C table accelerator. As I said, that's specific tables, specific workloads, but where you hit them, the gains are massive. And that's because taking advantage of that pure in memory uh, technology approach. Yeah, so here, here's why um, IBM C Table Accelerator might be faster. And it's largely because the, the number of subsystems that DB2 has to deal with a, a, a large number of different variant scenarios that DB2 can work in um, gives IBM Z Table Accelerator a faster code path. So typically from a code path perspe perspective, um, when reading a simple row of data, um, many uh, database management systems can be in the order of 10,000 machine cycles, um, whereas something that's relying purely on in-memory uh, techniques um, and assuming that that data in memory is the good memory is the good data, um, we're looking at between four and 500 machine cycles to retrieve a single row of data. So that's where the, we get the approximately 20 times faster um, performance from. Now I would like to talk about a, uh, a, a different um, in-memory technique. So this is uh, what we call uh, a fast insert technique. So the idea of um, um, fast insert is um, often when you're trying to update um, tables rapidly um, and you've got multiple applications that are looking to update that same table, uh, they need to lock the table. Um, so the second one, of the application locks the table, um, other other uh, applications are unable to update their table. Um, so you're not allowed to, uh, not able to do this this write in parallel, and that can really um, clog a system, um, particularly with certain workloads such as uh, um, uh, audit trails, where the um, the workload is to establish an audit trail. It becomes painful. Um, to have each application wait for every other application to do its uh, audit trail before the next one can move on. Um, so the idea with a fast insert is you actually split up the memory um, and you allocate a particular piece of memory to each application. Each one of the, each one of those applications now doesn't have to compete, and they can uh, insert um, the rows um, very quickly because they're they're not competing with other applications. Um, and then you need a separate process to actually uh, start to combine those different pieces of memory um, and, and move that data to uh, whatever the data store is. Um, so this uh, improves much faster. Um, it does have challenges. You need to recombine the data afterwards. Um, you potentially can't do the indexing until afterwards. You certainly can't do any sorting because you've got um, um, you've got data in different blocks of memory. But as far as an insert mechanism goes, um, it is uh, it is very fast. 
So chart. Um, DB2 uh, version 12 um, introduced a, a new insert algorithm, or they called it insert algorithm two, which worked exactly along the lines of that technique I was talking about. Um, and it, again, it's for journaling workloads. So it's specifically um, designed to for those audit trails or information that's primarily uh, um, write fast and potentially not read for quite uh, a length of time because you've still got to organize your indexes and whatnot after the fact. Um, so this new algorithm, um, the data has to be unclustered uh, because you're just adding it to the end of a space. You're not inserting it in, in the middle of a table. Um, so that, that fast insert algorithm uh, was added. And I believe got results for that coming up. Yeah. yeah. So when where 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 it's used or intended to be used by DB2 um, is when you've got that high rate of concurrent inserts into a journal or audit table. Um, so the um, you see these uh, really fast throughputs. Um, because you don't get that uh, locking uh, uh, competition. Um, next topic I'd like to talk about is uh, temporary in-memory tables. Um, so many different workloads need to create temporary tables um, for, a, for a number of different reasons. Um, so often um, uh, web applications will have temporary data related to the session information, the, the, the information of you know, what, the, uh, um, what the user has been uh, reading through the, the session on the web session. Um, some reporting applications uh, create their own tables uh, to organize and sort data to generate the report. And once they're done, they don't need that data anymore. Um, so this is what we call a temporary table. So typically um, a temporary table is going to be uh, uh, created uh, a number of different sorts um, uh, on it. And uh, then it's going to be uh, some kind of outputs going to be taken from it. And then the table itself is going to be forgotten. It's not needed anymore. Um, so when this type of workload is applied to in-memory tables, we do see uh, significant advantages. So um, by using in-memory tables, there's going to be no I.O. We can leverage the fast insert mechanism. So we can do a parallel write uh, to, to build that table. Um, we can then build the, the in-memory indexes. So they're very fast to create. They're very fast to execute. And then we can also leverage things like in-memory sort uh, as part of building that indexes. So by using in-memory tables for this, the, these types of workloads, we do see a significant advantage. And it actually hits on all the, all the scenarios where uh, in-memory uh, uh, technology can be advantageous. So next uh, section, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, memory uh, usage on the mainframe. Um, so at we, I often think of this as a pyramid. Um, so with the, the top of the pyramid being closest to the CPU and the bottom of the pyramid being furthest from the CPU. And even if the data could come from that location as fast as everywhere else, it's just got a physical distance to travel. And as we all know, you know a, a, a um, speed of light still only moves about yay far in um, a, a clock cycle. Having the data closer to the core um, can uh, really help us out. So as the uh, processor chips uh, evolve, we're finding there's more and more memory at that cache level, um, which is good. And uh, one of the important things is almost all the data has to actually at some point end up in that cache. Um, no matter where it is, um, it doesn't get to the CPU until it actually gets in through that cache. Um, so this this mechanism is the, the this this layering is always there, um, even if those uh, top level um, 
the core cache and the level three. So the level one, level two, level three, level four caches are all getting bigger and bigger with each evolution of the chipset. Um, that we still have that uh, that layering approach. So um, when you're looking at database data, um, we're often looking at data that's on disk, obviously, which requires a lot of IO. Um, these disks have buffers, which is good. Um, but we also know that um, once we've got it into system memory, we're looking at something about a thousand times faster than disk access. So I want to use that wherever possible. Um, so what's going to happen uh, when we look at the um, uh, the buffering techniques? Move to the next slide. Um, when we're looking at buffering, whether it be for whatever reason we're buffering, what we're doing is we're taking that that data out of disk and we're putting it into system memory. And obviously that uh, helps much faster, um, which is good. Um, and then what we find is when we move to in memory, uh, uh, pure in memory techniques, we tend to move up a, a, another tier. So what, when we go to the uh, in memory, uh, and, and you'll see some of this with the database systems, but it's more likely to occur um, with the uh, pure in memory tables. Um, we see that the the data that we're putting in or dedicating to these in memory tables is often small in size, um, and if the um, uh, app the the pure in memory tables. Um, uh, code has been written properly. Um, it's also a very small footprint. So the co combination of those two is both the, um, the the code to access the data and the data itself uh, tends to get into the cache quickly, tends to stay in the cache. And as a result, we see these second order uh, performance improvements simply because we've pushed everything into the cache lines. Um, so understanding the size of the cache lines and, and therefore the size your code path can be uh, is very important. Um, and when, when we see these extra order of magnitude uh, speed up because we've pulled everything into the cache and the applications don't have to uh, uh, wait uh, for time to, uh, um, to, to get their data. One of the things that will come up and has come up um, when we've been working with uh, customers that are implementing this technology is that because a lot of this stuff gets into the cache. There's never a wait in the application. Um, because there's never a wait in the application, other applications don't take over. And you will hear complaints of this application is hogging all my CPU. Now you can you can that, that's advantageous because it's running faster. Um, but you also need to put your appropriate workloads in place to to make sure that that application doesn't take. Uh, too much CPU away from others simply because it's able to run faster and use more CPU. So my final topic before I, I hand over to Andrew um, is to actually um, compare some of the different workloads. So um, when we talk about pure memory tables, we'll often get asked the question, how does that compare to uh, DB2 uh, a DB, uh, IDAA, so DB2 Analytics Accelerator. Um, and we, we would say there's there's very little overlap between what those pure memory table uh, performance improvements and what DB2 Analytics Accelerator performance improvements are going to achieve. Um, primarily because DB2 Analytics Accelerator, what it's doing is it's looking for very long running queries or the best workloads for it are very long running queries, typically analytical queries. And those very long running queries, DB2 Analytics Accelerator is very good at taking those long running queries and making them really short. Um, on the other hand, pure in-memory tables tend to um, be very good at extremely short running um, uh, transactions. So we're literally looking at just retrieving a simple row of data. So very, very, very short, uh, but ones that run very, very often. Um, so these um, uh, literally run millions or billions of time a day. And it's that very short running thing to accelerate it by that factor of 20 uh, helps um, improve your workload for the entire day. Um, neither one of these 
goes anywhere near close to covering all that DB2 is able to do. But they can, uh, as I said, give you huge performance gains for specific uh, uh, workloads. I've got a critic and a dog. Great. Okay. So uh, with that, um, back over to you, Andrew. Thanks, Larry. So I will uh, I'll button us up with the uh, the bigger picture, just trying to um, kind of tie together how all of what Larry just explained, all the different in memory techniques and and, um, <clears throat> and and tech information, how that kind of bubbles up to the surface and how we can start thinking about, you know, how does this affect me where I sit in my uh, company today? Right. So. I think one thing is to, you know, one thing that's always been useful is to is kind of know what are some of your, your peers doing? What are other companies doing? And so if you could draw a line down the middle of these statistics here and, and look at the one, uh, the two on the left, um, these are kind of explaining some of the longer term impacts of what we've seen with the pandemic and just some of the digital transformation that's accelerated things as we've come out on the other side of it. Um, you know, one personal example that I've that I've seen is um, not only has remote work been the norm um, for the past few years, but um, we've even seen it. You know, for for those that don't work remotely, I think this is a funny story. Is so I had a uh, I had a manager who moved from the UK and came uh, to the United States, and before he moved, um, he you know he would take public transportation every day in the UK. And it would, he'd have to wait in line and he had to get his train ticket and, and buy it and then and then board the train. But he was telling me when he moved back to the UK that um, everything had become digitized. No longer did he have to wait in line and buy his ticket. He could do it all through an app and he'd never even have to go to the train station, um, you know, early to get his ticket to be able to board these, to, to be able to board the tra public transportation. Um, and that's just one small example of some of the digital transformation is we're starting to see all of these um, all these services and things that we use on a daily basis catch up and start to digitize their offerings for everyone. Right. So that happened in a matter of, matter of a couple of years. And I think, you know, no matter where you are in the world, if you go out to dinner, you, you might be um, more inclined to see, a, you know, a digital way of ordering food or a digital menu um, than, and that's now the norm compared to what it used to be, right? So I think the expectation is here and it's among us. And so it's upon every one of us, especially a lot of what a lot of our executives are saying is over 2x, 2.5x of our executives now are saying, yeah, digital transformation is a paramount priority for us um here moving forward um after the pandemic um so now you know looking at the two most right statistics here uh the statistics most on the right hand side of the screen is um a couple of trends that uh we can use to push some of this transformation some of this digital transformation um so it's all about this hybrid or hybrid cloud uh, architecture, right? So that helps cu customers and companies get the most out of their IT spend. Um, so, you know, again, it's like putting the right workloads on the right plat platform and running them at the right times to give the best experience for our, our end users. And so in a lot of cases, we end up modernizing legacy applications and um, instead of pushing them down the road, it, it tends to be a lot better for, for us to go ahead and modernize them, right? And, you know, the, the statistics uh, there on the far right is um, was an interesting one. And one I learned recently is every five years, uh, your memory gets 10x cheaper. So when you think about that, when, when you have a whole factor of 10 like that every five years, it opens up new realms of possibilities um, and new ways of doing things at a very fast pace. And so what we've seen, you know, is that as memory improves and memory increases, as it did during the pandemic, all that digital transformation is going to continue to accelerate and we'll have new challenges for sure, right? Like there's a lot of a lot of things going on in, in terms of AI, cyber resiliency, uh, and how customers are approaching their hybrid cloud infrastructures. But as memory increases, so does that innovation. So um, one of the things that's that we've seen, um, you know, just from from where we sit at IBM is 
uh, 3x growth over the last decades in terms of uh, MIPS on the mainframe, right? And not only just MIPS, but if you can break it down into uh, into categories, it's it's talking about these, uh, you know, um, the dynamic growth of specialty MIPS, right? So Linux on Z, things like that, right? So this is where we've seen digital transformation has really taken off. Um, and and whereas everybody, you know, all the analysts or, you know, or maybe uh, mainframe haters out there, right? 10 years ago, they were saying, you know, this trend would have gone down, but we've seen the exact opposite. We've seen 3X growth and we've seen, um, you know, massive uptake of the Z15 two years ago, uh, well, actually three years ago now. Um, and it all kind of points towards, you know, what we've actually seen here in the last year, which is the, um, you know, you heard Larry mention it there at the end, which is the Z16, which launched uh, mid-2022. You know, um, and the feedback for the Z16 has been amazing. Um, and at the heart of the Z16 is this uh, Telem processor. So, it's this chip that's been fully redesigned and it introduces um, more performance and, and, and capacity growth for, for our, uh, our enterprise customers, right? And you can actually see where this accelerator chip here down at the bottom left. Um, and, you know, this design has done something amazing. It's increased the cash uh, quite a bit, right? So it's, it's improved the cash growth for uh, 1.5x. And, um, you know, this was, um, you know, and what this, you know, opens up the ability to do is to run um, essentially a virtualized L3 cache, but in your L2, right? Remember the pyramid that Larry was talking about earlier. Um, this is, I think this is like one of the, one of the things that comes to mind when it just helps us understand that we can do a whole lot more on a new Z16 than we could even on a 15 or a 14. And so because there's so much potential for this rapid processing in, in that cash line, it gives us so many more opportunities uh, to present ourselves uh, or that present themselves when, um, when we think about the amount of memory that's available to us now and how that can have an impact on our conversation, uh, on our uh, applications. So, I think the the big takeaway here is with newer hardware, and I'm not and I'm not advocating that everyone should go and get newer hardware, but we have this we have this technology available to us, right? And so with more memory and more cache, it means we have more capacity to 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 run you know newer, better, digitized workloads, but at a lower cost. And so, especially, I would say, if you're a tailored fit pricing um, customer, somebody who's taken advantage of tailored fit pricing, then this is going to dramatic. This could dramatically change, you know, how you do business, right? If, you know, if this is your licensing scheme, then you have the ability to kind of scale up and down on, you know, depending on your uh, the way the way that uh, users use your your platform, um, and you can. It also means that it scales up and down the cost, right? So um, you have some power to change things within your organization, knowing that this type of you know memory capacity exists out there for you to take advantage of. Um, so um, yeah, so that's that's kind of um, how I've been thinking through some of the bigger picture, right? More memory, more opportunity. Um, and, and thanks to Larry for, for walking us through all those, those different appli um, applications of in-memory technology and all the techniques and benefits of each one. I feel like I learned something new every time, but if you joined us late or if you're, you're just now joining us, we talked about uh, buffers, in-memory tables, in-memory indexes, fast inserts, temporary tables, and many things in between, right? So, um, you know, for a long time, DB2 has been leveraging these these types of technologies, and you know now that you know this type of innovation is here with more memory and more availability, it's it's about this time that our developers can actually take advantage of it as well and improve our applications performance, um, and in some cases dramatically. Right. So, yeah, you know, I guess one of the bigger takeaways if you're a developer here is if you have a mixed workloads, hybrid cloud workloads. Um, there's going to be different combinations of in-memory 
um, technology or in-memory benefits that you can take advantage of on a same on the same application, right? Um, so you might use pure in-memory in one place um, and and fast inserts in another, right? So um, so that is uh, that is the the quick and the quick and dirty summary. And so I'll just leave you with this: is if you're um, in you know you, the operations arm of your your company, um, one of the things that you can do is join the uh, IBM Z Systems AI Ops community. So people will be posting blogs, um, discussion topics, forums, and it's a good place to collaborate with people and learn more about the uh, the different technologies available to us um, at IBM um, and also in the industry, right? So that you can kind of learn and make better decisions for yourself and for your company. So. With that, we'll open it up for questions, and um, I won't leave it on this slide. I'll actually move it toward the uh, the, la the the last slide here, the GSE wrap up slide, so that you can either scan this QR code or or submit feedback. But we are ready for questions. If you have any, and I haven't seen any in the chat. Uh, I didn't see anything in the chat either. Um, you have all been set so that you can unmute yourself if you wish to ask a question directly. Uh, please do. Um, and the conference feedback uh, is also in the chat if you want to click on that or from the uh, bring your own agenda link. Uh, we'll take you straight there as well. Please provide feedback that we do use it. Um, please. Feel free to ask your questions. We will give it another minute just to see if anyone um, anyone types any questions. But if not, we are so glad you came. Hope you learned something new. And um, if, I you, did. if you have any, yeah, you did, Anna. Thank you. <laughs> Um, and if you have any questions, uh, our email is is easy to find on the uh, the GSE website where you register for the session. Um, yeah, thanks for coming, Adrian. See your comment there. Okay, so uh, I hope you all uh, enjoyed yourselves. Thanks to Larry and Andrew for that uh, presentation, and uh, thank you all for joining. Hope to see you again at some other session, and. Um, if no one's got a question, I can close the, the room. It was pretty clear, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> quiet, quiet bunch today. We try to, we try to answer uh, questions and, and anticipate them and, and uh, include that in the content. So that might, that could be a reason. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I think so too. Um, so thank you very much and uh, uh, goodbye for now. Thanks, Anna. Goodbye. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. Bye.